Welcome back to History 103. In this lecture, we will focus on the development of a political culture in the colonies. The focus will be on British political history and we'll cross the pond to the colonies and see how the people within the colonies were influenced by some of the ideas that were emerging in places like England and Europe. As you can see in this picture, it's actually um, a picture from the 1700s dealing with voting. We have to understand that this concept of voting is fairly modern, particularly where this idea that certain people have access to, um, uh, to the vote. And we're going to kind of uncover as to where these ideas come from. So the title of this lecture is The Development of Colonial America. So we're going to focus between 1730 and 1763, give or take a few years, uh, which is basically the, the, ta the time that the book chapter focuses on. And as I stated earlier, we're going to focus on political culture and also on this notion of freedom. What did freedom mean in this time period? So a lot of times we kind of confuse it as a very kind of general concept that has always been around, it's always been thought in the same way. And I want to show you that that's not the case. A great example of this would be looking at something like the movie Braveheart. And you always hear them kind of screaming the concept of freedom. And, uh, you know, freedom back then, I don't think it even existed, but it definitely did not mean uh, what it means today. So there is a history to this concept, and we're going to explore a, a little bit of it, not obviously not everything. Uh, but as, as I also noted, you know, freedom today definitely evolves from this, but it would have meant something very different in the 17, uh, 1700s. So let's look at our objectives. What are the goals for this lecture? What should you walk, uh, walk out understanding from this lecture? So number one, we're going to define British political culture. And we're going to kind of tie it with the English Civil War. So we're going to start by focusing in England and what's happening there and show you how the events in England are shaping these concepts in the colonies. And this is where you see the beginning of concepts that are so common to us today called inalienable rights. So at this moment, there's, there's just a bunch of groups kind of talking about these concepts, but it's not grounded on anything in, in particular. So we're going to move on and explain the philosophical grounding of political rights. And here we'll really focus on the Enlightenment era. So very general, we're going to be talking about the Enlightenment movement in places like France and England because they're the ones who kind of ground the basic um, ideologies that we more or less take for granted today, right? Freedom of speech, separation of powers, uh, and there's a bunch of other ones. You could take a European history class and, and dig a little bit deeper into these ideas. And then lastly, you know, we've been focusing on Europe at the beginning of this lecture, and then we're going to jump across the pond and we're going to look at the colonies and the way they begin to shape these same ideas um, in the colonies. So what did freedom mean to different communities? And unfortunately, I just don't have the, the time to talk about every single group, but you know, we'll, we'll touch on a few different communities um, to see how you know, they understood freedom and the way it kind of played out. All right, so these are the goals and um, let's get started. So let's begin by looking at the English Civil War. So in this slide, we are looking at Europe, uh, Britain, not the colonies, but I want to start there. So here you see a picture up here of somebody being beheaded and uh, I'll tell you who, who it is in a little while. And here's another picture that's very significant of the levelers, which I'll talk about in this lecture also. So the civil, the English Civil War, which was in the 1640s, uh, give or take, right? Uh, I mean, it lasted a, a, a quite a while and we won't dig too deep into it, but I want, to, I want to start a little bit further back. So one of the most significant questions that emerge from the colonial period 
was how colonists developed such a sense of individual freedom, particularly because that concept is so alien to the majority of the world at that time. The colonies were part of the British Empire, and they did share certain traditions and ideological beliefs, but ultimately they were viewed as a colony that were essentially controlled by a king. However, throughout the 18th century, colonists began to develop their own understanding of self while borrowing British political traditions and European philosophy. Many historians have connected American political consciousness with the Magna Carta of 1215, which limited the political authority of the English monarch, John II, against his barons. Historians have noted that the Magna Carta is significant because it is a written document stating exactly what a king can and cannot do, which to many Americans reminds them of a pseudo-constitution. In reality, the Magna Carta of the Middle Ages is really a document by the nobles re-establishing their rights that had existed generations before King John started to take them away. Anyone who reads it will see that it is not a precursor to the U.S. Constitution, but, ra but rather the belly aches of the nobility that felt like they were losing the authority they once held. This is key. The document just reiterated those rights on paper and forced the king to follow them and maintain tradition. In saying all this, I would argue that the English Civil War sorry, that the English Civil War of the 17th century is a much better starting point, especially because this event was taking place as the colonies were developing. So let's begin by examining not every aspect of the Civil War, but rather those events that help shape our understanding of quote unquote freedom and quote unquote individual liberties that will become significant as the colonies move towards independence. During the reign of James I, English Parliament feared that the king would implement the idea of royal authority, which was absolute, thus making the king all-powerful. His son, Charles I, would give credence to this belief as he imprisoned men who refused to make loans to fund his war against Spain or those that refused to collect duties on exports without Parliament approval. When confronted with these grievances, Charles I dismissed Parliament in 1629 and then ruled without summoning them again until 1640. Basically, he shut off government and just made all decisions by himself. During this tenure, he would collect taxes without Parliament consent, and he even supported the reintroduction of Roman Catholic rituals within the Anglican Church, which angered many Puritans. Such actions angered his subjects, which forced him to call Parliament, and they quickly set to dismantle many of Charles's policies. To make a long story short, all this led to a war where Charles was captured, tried, and executed in January of 1649, thus abolishing the monarchy itself. So what came out of this conflict? Though there's so much more to the English Civil War, However, for our purposes, the idea that emerged from this conflict are significant to colonial rule. And as I stated in this picture, you see the king, the king's head being chopped off. The significant of this is that you have to understand that kings believe that they were put uh, on the throne through God's grace. And by doing this, there's a sense that the king is not a representative God, right? So the first group we have to talk about during the English Civil War you know, era are the Levelers, who emerged as a political party that advocated for annual parliament meetings, for the separation of powers between the executive and the legislative branches of government, and the introduction of universal suffrage or MAD. Those are key ideas. Their idea of a written constitution listed inalienable rights which parliament could not infringe upon. Writer John Milton called for freedom of speech and of the press in 1649. 
These are radical ideas for the time. Uh, you have to understand that for the first time, people are proposing these concepts of quote unquote freedoms. Um, it's not rooted in philosoph philosophical thought, but they are being proposed. And it's a small minority who are making these statements. Another significant group were the diggers who advocated for the common ownership of land. So if these ideas sound familiar, they should, as they came about, not from a philosophical debate, but rather from a political dispute where a king demanded absolute power and the people resisted his authority, challenging the basic idea that a king receives his power and authority from God. This is truly a major step forward in our own basic understanding of quote unquote freedom. Yet at this particular moment, it was not at all accepted by the majority of people and would take decades before it became a common talking point, let alone a basic principle. After the English Civil War, the English throne was reestablished where Charles II and James II attempted to implement their will against Parliament, basically the same thing that the previous kings were doing. As we have seen time and time again, religious conflicts often led to political turmoil and as James began to appoint Catholics to positions of power, Parliament felt threatened and invited William of Orange, who was married to James II's daughter, who was a Protestant and had a claim to the English throne. So they invited William of Orange to invade England and in return, Parliament forced that William support the Declaration of Rights, which later became the Bill of Rights in England. Like the Magna Carta, the Bill of Rights limited royal authority. For example, it stipulated that subjects had the right to petition the king. Maintaining the military army in a time of peace was seen as unlawful. The levying of money without parliament's consent was seen as illegal. And freedom of speech and debate must be protected at least for parliament. So not everybody got this concept of freedom of speech. As you can clearly see from this list, many of these stipulations were, will be quote unquote borrowed much later as the U.S. becomes a nation. Though it, is, though it would be great and easy to say that the Glorious Revolution of 1689 was the starting point of American democracy, we must look at the actions within the colony beforehand that mimic actions that were seen as innate in colonial consciousness. If we examine New York, for example, as the English began to dominate the region's population, they sought to gain control. In fact, the English settlers in this Dutch colony backed the Charles of Liberties and Privileges, which was done in 1683, that advocated for elections amongst the property male population. It affirmed the rights of trial by jury and security of property and advocated for religious tolerance. These rights of Englishmen, as they were defined, were viewed as inalienable rights, particularly once self-rule was reestablished in the colonies with the success of the Glorious Revolution in England. Basically, the colonies felt that they should govern themselves to some extent. They, though they might not have been aware of their actions in regards to colonial, or sorry, in, in regards to political philosophy, these basic principles would become the cornerstone of our understanding of basic human rights that we assume we are born with, particularly as they would, uh, they, they could be better defined by people such as Locke and the Enlightenment philosophers of the 18th century. So let's examine these philosophical arguments as to why things like freedom of speech and so forth are seen as natural rights. So let's focus on the philosophical grounding of our modern understanding of individual freedom and inalienable rights, starting with John, John Locke's uh, text, Two Treaties of Government from 1690. A product of the Glorious Revolution, Locke's work was a protest against the absolutist policies of Charles II, where Locke argued that in a state of nature, people, and by people he means men, form a political society to protect their property. 
In doing so, a sovereign can rule, in other words, a king can rule, but what is key here is that he only rules due to the power of the people, only due to the power of men. And if he violates this relationship, let's say by limiting the inalienable rights of men, then they can replace him and overthrow the government. Challenging the medieval principle of an absolute monarch that, rule, that ruled through God's grace. So the basic idea here is that God did not put people in power, but that the people selected somebody to rule, to be a king or whatever, right? And this is a major break from the way societies have been developing up, you know, up to the you know, 17th century. A second philosophical argument emerged during what has been labeled as the Enlightenment era, which moved away from religious grounding and rather focused on human reason and rational thinking. With scientific works proving that the world functioned by universal laws, Enlightenment thinkers sought to apply the same principles to human reason. Thus, natural laws governing all human life provided an explanation for the unprecedented interests of the 18th century writers in non-European cultures, particularly those that were non-Christian. In other words, they saw Western society corrupted by religious dogma, by religious belief. In addition, this era challenged the medieval God that often intervened in people's lives, serving as judge and acting accordingly. So even like today, when we watch football players and say, oh, God help me catch a football, right? There's, there's that, that's a kind of like a medieval concept, right? Where the assumption is that God came down and help you catch a football <laughs> to win some game, right? It's, it's ridiculous, but people still have that kind of medieval thinking, even today. The Enlightenment era is moving away from that. So rather, the Enlightenment philosophers challenged such illogical thinking and saw God as a playwright of the universe and the author of natural laws, but was not actively involved in its operation. This is what has been defined as deism. Yes, God exists, but you know, he has better things to do than meddle in people's lives, right? <clears throat> so he created the rules, he created the laws, but it was up to humans to understand these natural laws. Lastly, these 18th century philosophers saw the potential of natural laws and reason to improve and transform society. Prior to this period, the dominant perspective was that ideal society existed in the past, such as in ancient Greece and in ancient Rome. And these places were like golden ages. In this new era, which is the 17th, uh, 18th century, anything was possible. The Enlightenment thinkers believed, such as, uh, such as corrupt institutions being able to be reformed and humans having the potential to achieve social justice. Many of the, the Enlightenment thinkers' ideas would become the foundation of our Constitution. Ideas like religious tolerance by Voltaire, Montague's political theory of separation of powers, Rousseau's general will, Thomas Paine's common sense, and even Mary Wollstonecraft's arguments on women's equality. Thus, when we read the U.S. Constitution, we see a social justice document influenced by Enlightenment era. That's what the Enlightenment era was all about. Can we make society better? And to some extent, the Founding Fathers ripped off Locke and many of these Enlightenment thinkers. Now, we're not going to limit the Enlightenment philosophical movement just to England because it does cross the pond. It does come to the colonies. So we do have this movement of Enlightenment in the colonies during the 18th century. So we see these Enlightenment ideas in the colonies even before the revolution. So aside from the very foundation of this country, we can explore how the colonists implemented Enlightenment ideals into colonial institutions. For example, Ben Franklin became of the very symbol of American Enlightenment. His scientific experiments with lightning and electricity utilized the scientific method. 
which is something the Enlightenment thinkers uh, were heavily influenced by the scientific revolution. However, Franklin's biggest contributions were centered around political and intellectual development, particularly with the establishment of the American Philosophical Society in 1743, the College of Philadelphia, the library company, a fire company, right, to make society better, and the first public hospital in the colonies. He even questioned the system of slavery, even though he himself had slaves. So following the Enlightenment ideals, one finds that progress and reform was practiced particularly for those that wanted a second chance. Though many of you have heard the story that Australia was founded by, by English thieves and criminals, which is something that they have embraced, we often neglect to look at our own history, you know, American history, and find that we were no different. So we were founded by criminals, right? It is noted that about 50,000 to about 55,000 were sent to the colonies from England uh, as criminals. So, I mean, it's not something we like to admit as being part of our history. I think it's about 10% of the population, right? I mean, it's a big chunk of people, right, <laughs> that were criminals. You know, we always like to talk about Puritans and city on, the head, uh, city on the Hill and religious freedom and all that type of stuff. But no, you know, we were founded by criminals and hookers, just like uh, Australia, right? Um, so we ignore the significant aspect of our narrative, a story we do not like to talk about when we teach U.S. history, particularly at the grade school level. Prisoners in Britain face harsh conditions, particularly for petty crimes, such as failure to pay back a debt. However, in England, there were reformers such as James uh, Oglethorpe, who secured parliamentary support for his plan to use colonization as an alternative to imprisonment. These quote unquote criminals would be sent to places like Georgia and would have a fresh opportunity to earn a living, challenging the old belief that humans were born depraved and could not be re rehabilit rehabilit <laughs> sorry, rehabilitated uh, if placed in a healthy environment. So this example illustrates the ability of human reform and progress in the U.S. colonies, which was influenced by European Enlightenment ideals. So we see this kind of uh, the shipping of criminals to the Americas throughout, uh, throughout the colonies. Uh, obviously, this example focuses on Georgia, where they try to create a utopian society. But you also have uh, places in Maryland, I think, believe Virginia, where criminals were sent there too. So now let's look of how the Enlightenment, uh, what I talked about earlier, the Civil War, begins to shape colonial uh, rule in, in what we now define as you know, the, the United States. So thus far, we've been focusing on Europe, right? I briefly talked about the Enlightenment era in the colonies, but for the most part, we've been focusing on the way England developed its its uh, ideas of freedom and, and you know with the Civil War and, and the Enlightenment era. Now we're going to focus in the colonies, all right? That will be for the next two slides. That will be our main focus. So let's start by looking at what this concept of freedom meant in the colonies. So first, we must note that the colonial idea of freedom was rooted in British political culture. Because of geography, we're so far away from England, the colonies practiced what was called salutary neglect, which basically meant self-rule. Due to the rising conflicts and rivalries throughout Europe, the colonies largely governed themselves throughout the early 18th century with large landowners, merchants, and lawyers who controlled colonial assemblies also controlled local politics. Let's look at a few examples of colonial politics and see how it functioned in the 18th century before the American Revolution. The political culture in the colonies tended to rest on those that were appointed, which were typically appointed by the crown, and any law passed by the local assembly 
could be easily overwritten by governors or the crown, particularly in the, in the late 17th and early 18th century. Only in Connecticut and Rhode Island did one have elected officials. What we see is that the idea of the people at this time, quote unquote, did not really have any real power in the grand scale. For example, in New England, the Duke of Newcastle, some guy in England basically, appointed every 83 colonial officials. In places where free men, quote unquote, had the right to vote, we find that they were often indifferent as many felt that wealth, social prominence, and education were pre-qualifications to hold office, thus limiting the voting pool. Those that did vote could be persuaded to vote for a particular candidate by, quote, distributing food and liquor freely at the courthouse where balloting took place, unquote. Just to give you one example, when jo Thomas Jefferson ran for office for the House of Burgesses in 1768, his expenses show the cost of two men and rum at the polling locations. There were many nuances when it came to the concept of voting, though. However, it was grounded in the belief that those with property had an economic interest in the prosperity of a community and were, quote, of independence of judgment, unquote. Quote, slaves, servants, tenants, adult sons living in their parents' home, the poor, and all women lacked a will of their own and were therefore in ineligible to vote, unquote, as one historian has noted. Though it was restricted to mostly white men, we find that compared to England, where only about 5% of the men could vote, in the colonies, due to the vast amount of property available, about 50 to 80%, give or take, of white men, uh, of the white male, could actually vote. Of the white male population, sorry, could actually vote. What stood out in the colonies was that the was of the power of the assemblies, which began to dominate in the mid 18th century, so around the middle 1700s, you know, 1730. Utilizing the principle of popular consent uh, to government, assemblies were seen as protectors of quote the people's liberty unquote. Essentially, these assemblies mimic the House of Commons in England. And because we lacked a, any kind of royal group in the colonies, such as the House of Lords, and the book talks about this too, the House, uh, the House of Commons, uh, sorry, the, the, the assemblies gradually transformed themselves into governing bodies reflecting the interests of the people. So, kind of thank God for this neglect, right, uh, from England, uh, from, you know, this neglect from the British crown, some of these colonial assemblies gained real power and influence over local community issues, to the point that royal governors often complained that assemblies had exercised authority that did not belong to them. Assemblies even controlled the salaries of different government officials, particularly the governors, uh, therefore forcing them to concede authority to the assemblies. For example, in 1728 in Massachusetts, legislature reminded the governor that it was, quote, the undoubted right of all Englishmen to raise and dispose of monies for the public service of their own free accord without any compulsion, unquote. In other words, the assemblies controlled the power of the purse. As the colonies began to feel more independent from the crown, they also increased their critique of colonial rule. Though today we often equate, quote, freedom of the speech, unquote, as a basic God-given right, we have to understand that such concept was regulated to British Parliament in order to represent their constituents and not, and not be restricted by an authority such as the king. So freedom of, the speech, uh, freedom of speech had nothing to do with our modern concept of public liberties. Rather, freedom of speech had no legal protection 
And if you decided to, you know, say whatever came to your mind during this period, uh, you could be imprisoned or even killed if you express ideas that could be seen as a threat. So again, freedom of speech was regulated to parliament, not to everyday people. Another important concept is the, the freedom of the press that we all assume is a basic right. So this concept, freedom, freedom of the press, emerged from the English Civil War. As you may recall, the levelers advocated for these basic principles, but governments both in the US and Britain saw these rights as too radical because ordinary citizens could be easily prone to violence by inflammatory printed material. In other words, people cannot be trusted, right? With so much freedom. In fact, it wasn't until 1695 when printed material could not be censored. Though publishers could be sued for, quote, seditious libel, unquote, for defaming government officials. With this in mind, we saw a rise in the printed word with, a col with col colonial literary rates increasing to 75% of free adult males and about 33% of women being able to read and write. With such a surge, library institutions increased and reading became quote unquote fashionable by the 1730s with political debates dominating the pages. By 1765, about 25 colonial newspapers were established. So we see how principles that we take for granted today came to be. All these rights that we see in the U.S. constitutions were developed throughout the 1700s, both in England and in the colonies. So we see how freedom, whatever we're talking about, right, with freedom of vote, uh, freedom of the press, freedom of speech, is being constructed, right? No one person gave it to these colonists. So we address the idea of how freedom was being developed and who was included. Now we're going to talk about what has been defined as the American paradox. So here I'm going to talk about two different groups and um, pay close attention as to this idea of inclusion and exclusion. So we begin by looking at the Great Awakening. The chapter um, that you read for this module addresses the Great Awakening. And here I'm going to really kind of focus on one particular group, all right? So the book talks about it, you could read what it says there. It's very influential, but um, you know, I'm, I'm tying it back to this entire lecture when it comes to this concept of quote unquote freedom. So, I, like I said a, a second ago, I want to approach it from a different angle or a different lens, right? This concept of the Great Awakening, which is really kind of key to the overall thesis of this lecture. As the book noted, the Great Awakening was a wave of religious revivalism that was inspired by George Whitfield's preaching tours in the mid-1700s. Ultimately, this religious frenzy, though Christian, set the tone to challenge not only the Christian orthodoxy, but also the very system of hierarchy, thus promoting a new egalitarianism with an appeal that cut across gender, race, and slave status. This new challenge allowed women to have a greater voice in religious worship and in church affairs, particularly because they made their presence known by their physical manifestations of the spirit. They wept and cried out, they moved and flailed around, making their connection to God so much closer than before. This relationship caused men to worry as it went against the conventional wisdom of womanly behavior. One such figure was Mother Anne Lee, who was part of the Shaker religious community and was a preacher and saw herself as a prophet who dressed in male clothing and refused to answer to her female name, only answering to the name Public Universal Friend. Other congregations allowed women to vote 
for deacons, act as preachers, speak openly in church, allow women to be deacons or elders, and discuss religious, religious disputes. This was radical for the time, right? Women felt included in you know, some of these uh, awakenings that were taking shape. Another key figure was Jemima Wilkinson, who believed she was the, the reincarnation of Christ and had a large following throughout the northern colonies. She refused not only to answer to her name, but insisted that her followers avoid the feminine pronouns of she and her. She dressed in a, quote, light cloth cloak with a cape like, like a man's purple gown, long sleeves that stretched to her wristbands, a man's shirt down to the hands with a neckband, a purple handkerchief or neck cloth tied around the neck like, like a man, hair combed turned over and short, and would wear a watchman's hat, unquote. Basically, she dressed like a man. Ultimately, she was challenging the gender systems of her age by seeing herself either equal to a man or at least gender neutral, which is a major threat to patriarchy in the colonies. In all, the Great Awakening was liberating for many, but specifically women who now utilize religious dogma and institutions to challenge the very nature of the second sex. The idea that they were right less than men. They show that women were capable of being leaders and sought freedom through their evangelicalism, challenging the very system of power and oppression that their counterparts were fighting against. So they're almost kind of like holding a mirror to the men saying, you're fighting against oppression from England, yet you're not seeing that you're doing the exact same thing to us. As we have seen, the colonies were politically connected to England, but were slowly separating, developing their own political consciousness, even though they might have borrowed much from the motherland. Many of you are aware of the slogan, quote, no taxation without representation, unquote, which is something that is so ingrained in our society today, yet we are not aware how the colonists defined such a concept in the 18th century. Much of the rhetoric used during the 1760s to critique England emerged from the, that American institution known as slavery, which is ironic because many of these political leaders could not fathom others having those same freedoms that they sought for themselves, yet used the term slavery for their own cause. To them, freedom was restricted to a particular class, gender, and race. Yet the rhetoric used against the British would set a revolution. These American colonists felt that their, quote, shared British heritage, unquote, made them immune to colonial rule, almost as though saying, we are equals with the British. John Adams complained against the Stamp Act, stating in the Boston Gazette, Quote, I think he used a pseudonym for this. Quote, we won't be their Negroes. Providence had never intended the American colonists for Negroes, and therefore never intended us for slaves. Unquote. This is a telling comment as white American colonists knew the evils of slavery, but reserved citizenship to only themselves. Thomas Jefferson and Thomas Paine both noted the importance of liberty by connecting their status with slaves. Both men noted that if, quote, American, Americans lost their political liberty, they would be transformed into slaves of a tyrannical British king and parliament, unquote. Kind of like arguing, you're treating us like slaves, <laughs> right? Uh, yet they're not seeing the contradiction in their statement. In fact, Thomas Jefferson made a reference to chattel slavery, actually blaming King George III for the slave trade in the original draft of the Declaration of Independence by stating, quote, violating its most sacred rights of life and liberty in the, in the persons of a distant people who never offended him, capturing and carrying them into slavery in another hemisphere, or to incur miserable death in their transportation, unquote. So this was in the original Declaration of Independence. 
In this example, Jefferson literally tells the king that he has blood on his hands. However, due to Southern protests, that sentence was stricken from the final version due to the importance of slavery in the colonial economy. What these founding fathers were trying to say was that they were being treated like slaves, which they weren't, uh, even though they were British brothers. However, by using that language, it allowed them to envision themselves as the victims, gaining sympathy throughout the colonies, yet ignoring those that were actually enslaved or were second-class colonists. This also tells us that American colonists uh, were not ignorant of the double standard of their understanding of freedom and the second-class status of slaves. In fact, there were a few that challenged people like Adams and Jefferson, such as John Woolman and Anthony uh, Benezet, both Quakers who questioned the institution of slavery by publishing anti-slavery pamphlets in the 1760s. Others, such as Nathaniel Appleton, defended his anti-slavery position on the basis of one's Quote, natural right to be free, unquote. Even Thomas Paine, in his pamphlet, American Slavery in America, associated slavery with, quote, murder, robbery, uh, lewdness, and barbarity, unquote. It is a shame that more colonists did not see the hypocrisy, particularly since they recognized it right away, since they saw their cause so closely related to slave status, yet ignored it completely. And I want to end with this um, statement by Phyllis Wheatley, the African-American female essayist and poet, who said it best when she wrote to Samson Oakham, a Native American, and said to him, quote, In every human breast, God has impl implanted a principle, which we call love of freedom. It is impatient of oppression and pants for deliverance. And by the leave of our modern Egyptians, I will assert that the same principle lives in us. How well the cry for liberty and the reverse disposition for the exercise of oppressive powers over others. I humbly think it does not require the penetration of a philosopher to determine." Unquote. This is the paradox. It is so obvious that we all have it within us, this basic principle does not need some European scholar to teach us such a simple belief. Rather, it is nature who has given it to all of us. So it's a very great quote saying that we all have freedom. Unfortunately, certain people restricted other people from having it. And here you see a picture of Phyllis Whitley. So let's conclude this presentation and address the major points that were talked about in this lecture. So as I tried to stress, a lot of historians have gone back to the Magna Carta. Uh, as I mentioned, it, it's not a fair comparison with the American Constitution. As, as I noted, the only exception is that it was something that was written on a piece of paper. Therefore, people were now required to follow it. Uh, outside of that, uh, there's really no comparison. So most people will look to the uh, English Civil War and see the connection um, so much better. Uh, a second kind of major point, and, and this one's key, because we see the colonies more or less kind of separating themselves from the empire. And part of this had to do because the European powers were fighting amongst each other, which gave some liberty for the colonists to do their own thing, basically to kind of govern themselves. So this allowed them to borrow kind of some of these intellectual ideas from the crown, but then also create their own, particularly with the assemblies, and establish their, their own form of government that was much more localized in regards to the colonies. And then lastly, I address how different groups begin to define this concept of freedom. As I noted, 
you know, even poor whites could not uh, adhere to this notion of freedom. It, you know, it wasn't accessible to them. It's a very selective group. Um, but we do see this concept of freedom evolving from generation to generation to today, right? It includes uh, the majority of people for the most part, right? Um, and we have to understand that this is an evolution of this concept. And we see it with the levelers, right? During the English Civil War, they came up with it. And then you have the Enlightenment thinkers kind of putting the philosophical argument behind it. But I think Whitley's statement says it best that, you know, this is something that comes from within, that we all have this need of freedom, right? It does not need to come from some intellectual European um, ideal, but rather that any person uh, alive on earth has this will. And that's what's really key. And that's what really kind of made her stand out. Um, looking at how enlightenment is not really just a European concept as this, you know, African-American uh, woman was, you know, saying the same thing <laughs> without, um, you know, kind of basing it on some kind of European um argument all right so we'll end it there hope you feel like you learned something and um and hopefully you also completed the quiz as you were listening to this lecture